Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking Politics. My name is Nico Johnson, I'm the political correspondent here at the Post Millennial. And today, I'm with the Canadian icon, the former National Post columnist, and a TPM contributor, which I think is perhaps her best quality, uh, Barbara Kay. Barbara, thank you so much for coming on, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So you wrote an article a few days ago titled Why I'm Leaving the National Post and it, it, it went viral almost. And I'm quite interested to hear again why you left and, and why you felt it was really necessary for you to do so. I, I think uh, what's happening at the National Post um, is happening at... Um, well, certainly it happening at all conservative newspapers and virtually all newspapers, but not all, not just newspapers. It's happening to institutions everywhere. Um, and uh, as Mark Stein put it in an obituary of, um, uh, of a conservative uh, professor who just took his own life last week because he had been hounded mm. uh, so badly by people wanting to cancel him and they ended up canceling him in a big way. Um, he said newspapers are becoming college campuses, and so are other institutions. But I, you know, of course, I was concentrating on the newspapers, and and by that he meant that what what is happening is that um, for some time now, campuses have been sort of ground zero uh, for what you you know identity politics, um, social justice activism. Uh, and a kind of mentality of um, moral purity on certain issues, anti-racism issues. But, but the idea that a person has to be a social justice activist in order to be a moral human being mm. uh, is inculcated in university kids. And that generation of kids that has been, I would say, indoctrinated uh, with this idea that they have a mission in life to uh, create this sort of utopia, this anti-racist utopia, um, they're now, they've left university and they're now in the junior ranks of many institutions, newspapers amongst them, and they, they uh, feel that it's quite normal uh, for a junior staffer to be telling their bosses uh, what they can print and what they can't print or uh, well, this opinion is not just something I disagree with, but it's something that no newspaper should be allowed to print or uh, should not permit these kind of views. So you, you've, we've, had, we've seen many incidents of um, editors resigning. Uh, there was the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, Inquirer editor who had to resign because he had approved a headline called Buildings Matter to um, you know, and it was really, it was about all these lovely old architectural uh, treasures in the city being defaced and vandalized as part of the protests. Uh, it's a perfectly legitimate uh, mm -hmm. opinion to hold, but, you know, the people working at the paper, they just thought this was scandalous um, and he was forced to resign. He was somebody, you know, who's, who's a liberal, a, a progressive himself. Uh, but it doesn't matter then in this kind of climate um, of, uh, of um, it's kind of totalitarian. I mean, I'm not the first one to say that. Yeah, uh, it's not good enough to say I'm sorry. Uh, no, out. You you know you're finished. Goodbye. Uh, you don't deserve to be at this newspaper. You don't deserve to be part of decent society. Almost. So uh, you've got all these editors, uh, at newspapers who are gripped. By fear, they and it's a legitimate fear that maybe they'll be next to be cancelled. Maybe, maybe the same thing's going to happen to them as is happening to uh, some of these examples. So, it's come to our newsrooms as well. And really, in terms of mainstream print newspapers, there's only one that whose brand is conservative. That's the National Post. Uh, I've been writing for them to, for 20 years and felt very much in sync with their brand. I never had a problem before, but as a result of uh, this wave of um, kind of turbulence in the ranks and uh, pressure coming from below, 
I think that uh, it's a very complex situation. I don't, I just want to make it clear, I don't blame my editors uh, for t trying to walk a judicious path between upsetting uh, people in the newsroom and uh, holding on to their commitment to freedom of speech uh, for their old time, you know, opinion writers. So it's a difficult path for them to walk. Uh, and I first began to notice the, the effect on me. Uh, I, I began to notice that sometimes there would be a delay in my columns being approved and, and put online. Mm -hmm. uh, that never used to happen. And it started to happen with some regularity. There'd be edits called for that I wasn't 100% comfortable with. But I, you know, I'm a team player. I, uh, and I'm I'm not one of these prima donnas that no you can't change a comma of my beautiful prose. I'm very compliant with editing. Yeah. Um, and then one was spiked, and I didn't quite understand why. And then another one was spiked. Uh, kind of ironically, when they would be spiked, I would hand them into the Post Millennial, and say, "Do you want to print this? Because I can't use it, you know, at the Post." And they said yes, and they would go online, and nobody ever complained about them. Nobody ever said, "Oh, these opinions are out of bounds," or, or you know, no decent person could hold such an opinion. So, it began to feel very surreal. On the one hand, I was publishing at the Post Millennial with no problem whatsoever, stuff that was becoming more problematic at the National Post, and I could sense um, that the trend was kind of accelerate it was escalating and and that there might come a time when i would have to consider my future there because i was losing confidence um in my ability to satisfy uh what seemed to be new requirements uh, and i look back on some of my older columns and i said it's interesting even two years ago i was saying things that i realized that i would not be allowed to say now so clearly Things have changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, there was a pivotal moment. Uh, it was, I had written a review of a book by uh, an accredited scientist. Um, you know, this whole transgender debate is one that I've, I've sort of um, gotten immersed in with both feet. In fact, I write a lot about it at the uh, Post Millennial. Uh, and was a good book and was published by a reputable major publisher, Simon & Schuster. So I reviewed the book. Mostly I was talking about um, Deborah So's own beliefs and opinions and I endorsed them because I do feel she's right. So when that got spiked, I thought, well, it's, it's very clear to me that it's no longer even a question of my own opinions. Now, if somebody's whose book I'm reviewing holds the wrong opinions, and I should say that Deborah So was until recently writing for the uh, Globe and Mail and expressing those exact opinions. The Globe and Mail is supposed to be to the left of the National mm -hmm. Post. So I thought, gee, this is in the last year, we've gone from the Globe and Mail could print this stuff, I'm sure they wouldn't now, to the National Post, which would have felt very free to print it and no longer does. Um, where's my home? You know, is this, I'm, when a writer starts to second guess every sentence they write and saying, is this going to pass? Is this going to pass? And then you lose confidence in your writing. It's no fun to write. Uh, really the joy was starting to go out of it. And uh, I thought, I don't want to leave this place in anger. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm going to leave, I think I should leave when it's there's goodwill on both sides and when I have nothing bad to say about anybody, which I don't. I, I love the people that I work with. Um, it really was a question of, of not just principle, but it was um, in order to, in order to uh, serve my own um, professional caliber of my writing. So that's how it happened. Right. Well, well, it's very strange because I, I think a lot of metropolitan people in particular view the National Post as being a bastion of Canadian conservatism. And yet when it comes to social issues, they seem to capitulate to their newsroom, apparently. 
And we've heard rumours, I, I think Candeland printed this a few years ago, that uh, the National Post editors, or at least their owners, wanted to move the publication to the right. So uh, why, why is this happening? In particular, and you, you touched on this a little bit, but why are the editors so fearful? Social issues, social issues are the most charged. Uh, social issues are the ones that bring out the most emotion in people. Um, and it's quite interesting. Uh, there are some issues now that even I, and I, I, I used to feel that I could wade in on pretty well all the issues of the day. But the one that I really don't want to go near at all is this whole racism, systemic racism, yeah. language, all of that, uh, because I think it, it stems almost entirely from emotion and that the people that are most passionate about anti-racism are those least likely to be willing to engage in a rational discussion. You see this, for example, uh, around the idea of systemic police racism. And it's just mm -hmm. an article of faith that the police are racist. Um, and it doesn't matter if you, well, let's look at the data. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. They don't. People don't want to hear about data. The Wall Street Journal, for example, um, regularly runs columns by someone called Heather McDonald. I don't know if you've heard of her from the I American. Haven't. Okay, she's from the American Enterprise Institute, and and she makes a specialty of studying uh, all the data around police, uh, policing, crime, and racism. And uh, you know, she does a tremendous amount of research in this area. Uh, so everything she says is backed up by evidence. And, and she's been writing for the Wall Street Journal for years. Well, she, in June, she wrote an article saying, epidemiologically speaking, the police are not racist. Because if you look at the figures, you look at the number of people that are killed. You know, I mean, she went through a whole litany of data and statistics to show that in that sense, it's not that it's not that there are no racist incidents. There are many. There are many. She says, but if you're talking about systemic racism, all right. So she she wrote that article, and then there was blowback, and and they got their newsroom reacted. Uh, they didn't like it. They don't want her in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. So they they had that that issue the same as when Rex Murphy at the National Post, you uh, you probably saw his column. Or yes, uh, I love Rex Murphy. Well, th that's the thing. Um, <laughs> I would say that I would say uh, that if you if you were to look at the demographic of people who love the National Post, I would say 90% of them or well, a lot of them read the National Post primarily for Rex Murphy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that his his readership is faithful and um, passionate about his writing. And he is, he is a national treasure and he is unique, his style, his- He's his a wonderful writer. writer. I'm he deep is, he's eloquent and he, uh, uh, he's erudite uh, and his sense of humor is, you know, he's, he, there's nobody like Rex. Uh, and that's why he has such an enormous following. So he wrote a column on, his opinion was, um, racism is not systemic in Canada. There are incidents of racism, but it's not systemic. I don't think he's, he's not on social media. I don't think he's, he is quite as knowledgeable about how charged a subject <laughs> this is. <laughs> uh, and maybe uh, his, if he, maybe he could have chosen a little more delicacy in the way he approached it. I don't know. I, I don't want to second guess Rex's writing. He is who he is. Anyways, uh, the blowback, of course, as you know, was intense. Extraordinary. Yes. And um, the result was that that editorial gave uh, space in the opinion pages to one of the staffers who, uh, a woman uh, of uh, Indian prov uh, provenance, and she wrote a I'm sorry, Indian, I'm, I think Asian anyways. Um, and she wrote a very scathing uh, rebuttal to Rex that a lot of people felt was, hmm, you know, she's not an opinion columnist. She's a staffer in 
uh, I think at the Financial Post. And that for a lot of people was a kind of turning point where they felt, you know, maybe that wasn't such a great idea um, to do that because it gives the impression that uh, if a columnist writes something that's unpopular, and all of us do at, at a certain point, that um, it's that it's going to not only be judged uh, internally by people who are not editorial, but they are going to have to be deferred to if they don't like it uh, mm -hmm. enough. And there's a lot of conflict around that decision. Well, I think it's uh, the people who perhaps inhabit the National Post newsroom. They are part of this cohort of young people who are almost religious about social justice. And to criticise this is to blaspheme, which is why I think they react so strongly whenever there is a column who possibly attempts to criticise the movement. Um, and, and I don't know where it's going to end. And I feel a bit depressed about the whole matter because I, I think we've basically lost, you know, the Conservatives, particularly in North America. I don't think it's swept over the Atlantic yet. But certainly in North America, I, I see what's happening at the New York Times. I see what's happening at the Washington Post, even at the National Post. And I think, well, well, how are we going to combat this? I, 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 I'm sorry to say that I share your pessimism. I, I think there are uh, what you would call the zeitgeist. You know, this is the winds of change that blow and, and people get caught up in the current um, and it's like standing trying to hold back the tide. Um, it's too strong. You you beat against the current, but if there's if there aren't a, a critical mass of people that are have the resolution uh, to push back and and hold it. So I feel we're in one of those moments. And now, for the first time in my life, although I've read a lot of history about revolutionary movements and the Soviet revolution, the Russian Rev revolution, the French revolution. And it's the first time in my life where I feel that I can understand in a visceral sense how revolutions happened, like real revolutions. You know, mm. they, uh, these, these riots, um, they have a bad feel to me. They have, uh, um, feels like we're on the edge of something. And maybe, maybe that's partly because I'm old and old people tend to be alarmed quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I keep second guessing myself and saying, okay, steady on, steady on, you know, I mean, this, but you're a young person uh, and you're alarmed and you're, you have a sense of despair about this crisis. Uh, so yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to say, oh, no, 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 no. We've been through this before. It's but I haven't been through this before, so, uh, and I, the, you know, I, I, uh, I've seen, you know, the, the 1968, the countercultural, that, that basically was a movement that had a focus, Vietnam, like, we need to get out of Vietnam. It wasn't, it wasn't this sort of diffuse, we hate America because America is just a horrible country altogether, uh, and the West, in fact, is a horrible country all of them made up of horrible white people who are beyond redemption, that they can never make up for the pain and suffering they have caused uh, black people and other minorities, their imperialism. Um, there is not a good word to be said about America's constitution, um, which we are now told is built upon a, a slaveocracy, that America's founding was in essence uh, grew out of uh, a, a, a slavery movement. That's not the case. Um, so, and now it's spilled out of the campus. The you know the marches for against Vietnam are extremely focused on that one. And once once mm -hmm. once the war ended, it sort of settled down. Now you get the feeling that it's protest for protest's sake violence for its own sake and and this organized movement called antifa uh, it's quite scary because it is very organized yes well you, you know I, I spoke to douglas murray uh last year um before you know this <laughs> terribly tumultuous 2020 
And he obviously wrote The Madness of Crowds, which turned out to be terribly uh, prophetic. Um, but he was quite positive about the whole situation. He thought that the quiet majority, and I'm always quite cynical about people who claim to have the support of the quiet majority, but nevertheless, he said that the quiet majority seems to think that this social justice culture, this cancel culture, is ridiculous and pathetic. And that if you actually were to ask um, you know, the, the Canadian public what they thought about all this, they would side on the whole with conservatives. And I think this has been proven by the fact that Jeremy Corbyn lost in Britain. I think it was proven with Trump's election in the first place. And perhaps if a conservative leader wins, you know, next year in the, the election, whenever that comes, it will prove them too. So, uh, so perhaps we shouldn't be all too gloomy. But right now, we can reasonably say that electorally, the cancel culture and the social justice movement isn't successful. Well, you could say that perhaps electorally. Uh, myself, I'm the reason for my despair is that uh, if you look at the... Um, institutions you know we talk you often hear this phrase the long march through the institutions so if you look at um, uh, institutions like social services the medical profession um, the legal profession uh, sports um, education pedagogy all of these institutions they the people who have the power in them are very much committed to the social justice narratives, what our children and learningers are learning at school from K-12 right on up uh, is the social justice narrative, identity politics, mm -hmm. um, gender politics. Uh, so, you know, one of my interests, for example, is, is uh, women's sports. Uh, right now, we see the, uh, the, the trans agenda being translated into um, a, a, a very negative situation where you know male bodies and female sports but and the people that are uh, justifying it are, are using the language of rights the language of rights uh, as if it were a human right to be able to self-identify um, as somebody as, as something you're not and, and that gives you the right to be in the spaces that are reserved for uh, so but I don't want to get off into too many things. <laughs> in legal in legal terms, for example, uh, the idea just look at the idea of compelled speech. I don't think most people are very aware uh, that this is becoming more and more of an issue uh, where you are forced to uh, say that you believe in certain things that you may not believe in, but that you're forced to say so anyways. Um, I could give examples of that. Uh, so, uh, but in general, I would say that uh, the reason I'm not as optimistic, perhaps, as Douglas Murray, uh, is that that I, I agree that conservatives or even ordinary liberals uh, agree that there's a lot of nonsense out there. But they feel very helpless to do much about it because a lot of that nonsense is now entrenched in law, and it's entrenched in Things like medical uh, ethics, uh, uh, therapists are not allowed to, you know, do conversion therapy. It's not conversion therapy that they want to do. They want to practice regular therapy, uh, but that's no longer considered admissible. Um, I don't mean to keep coming back to that, <laughs> that issue, but it's the one that I deal with a lot. Um, and I think the universities are terrible. I think they are really recruitment centers for uh, far left activism. The Democratic Party, for example, has been pretty well, I mean, it's in, been infiltrated by far leftism um, to which moderate Democrats in the US feel they have to defer. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not. I, I'm not very sanguine about hopes for a, a conservative revival that is wholesome, healthy, and one that ordinary people feel they can sign on to if they're liberal, uh, if they're Democrats that are moderates. I mm. see division everywhere I look. I see horrible division. 
that there doesn't seem to be a middle ground. The, the activists seem to have um, taken over the podium. There's no, uh, you know, the internet, social media. Uh, it is, you know, Barry Weiss, when she left the, the uh, New York Times, she said, it's as if Twitter is running the editorial board. I thought that was kind of summed up the situation. Um, moderates are either afraid to speak or when they do speak, they feel very drowned out by this very aggressive, uh, loud, I don't mean to harsh your mellow in terms of your optimism. I, I would like to feel optimistic, but I, where do you see that? Where do you see this playing out in any kind of a, an optimistic scenario? Do you think that in the next election in the U.S., do you think that if Biden wins, that the voices of moderation are going to uh, prevail? No, but perhaps they will be sedated. Uh, not the voice of moderation. I, I think the real radical elements will be sedated if Biden wins. Whereas I think if Trump wins, it will only encourage these people to, to you know, do what they've been doing. But in fact, that's a way of, you know, that, that, that's surrendering. So I, think, I, I actually think, although I, I have no brief for uh, the Democratic Party or Joe Biden, who's going to be a figurehead in any case, um, I, I'm very fearful about um, there's a kind of hysteria around. He's 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 a very divisive figure. Yeah. Um, and even when he does something that's good, nobody notices because uh, by his own design, he his own personality is so much to the fore that it's very hard to see past him and his ego. And uh, four more years of Trump derangement syndrome, and 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 a lot of it justified. Let's let's be honest. I don't. I I I think it was it'll wreck. The country it's it's uh yeah like, well yeah. yeah kind of have to hope yes, yes. It doesn't well that's been a terribly gloomy podcast it's, it's usually somewhat more enthusiastic <laughs> but oh no it, i know i know I do apologize, viewers, but thank you so much for coming on. I really, really do appreciate it. And, uh, and perhaps we'll, we'll have you on again in the near future. I'd love that. Thanks, Nico.